looks forward to joining us. So, President Tim, without further ado, I, I invite you to induct Una as a member of the Rotary Club of London. All right, Una, um, in joining Rotary, you are joining a network of 1.2 million friends, neighbours, leaders and problem solvers in 33,000 Rotary Clubs around the world, where we see a world where we can unite and take action to promote peace, to fight disease and to support education and eradicate or help to eradicate poverty. The Rotary Club of London was the first club to be chartered outside of North America. Uh, and when next we get back to the Chesterfield Hotel, whenever that will be, I will invite you to look at two things. First of all, you should look at our charter dated 1912. And you will see that the, uh, Roach, the RI president at that time was a gentleman called Paul Harris, who you will hear a lot more of as you progress through Rotary. You should also have a look at our family tree. It shows the Rotary Club of London at the top and all the clubs in London that have been formed since 1912, some of which are still in existence, some regrettably not shown. But it, it's worth having a look at those two things. Yeah. Once we get back to normal, there are many ways that you can uh, assist our club. We are a large club. We have lots of committees in our club um, and you need to find out and work out which committee you might be interested in joining so that you can take an active part in Rotary. Um, if you just come along to the lunches every Monday, that's fine and it's interesting, but there are more things you can do to contribute to the club if you have the time and the inclination. So I would like formally to welcome you to our club and we look forward to seeing you in the flesh once we get back to the Chesterfield. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I cannot uh, give you your badge and your name badge, uh, Ona, obviously, but we will get that to you once we get, to, we get back to, I was going to say live meetings, but I think you know exactly what I mean. If there's anything you would like to say, uh, please uh, do so uh, briefly. Yeah. yeah, I just want to thank you and super excited about it, yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity. In the meantime, one of the things we normally do is to drink uh, the loyal toast. So if you could grab your glass of wine, your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, cup of water, or pretend drink, and remain seated. And let's have our toast to the Queen. The Queen. Dame Esther, can you hear me? I can hear you, but can you hear me? Can you see me? We can yeah, hear, you see you. hear you. Very, very loud and clear. Absolutely fantastic timing. Thank you so much indeed. So, bang on cue. I am delighted uh, to welcome you, Dame Esther, to the Rotary Club of London, where you've been many times before. Um, I myself am of an age when I have a vivid memory of watching you on Sunday nights at 7.25. My goodness, it goes back a long, long way. Uh, and for the younger members who don't go back such a long way, uh, That's Life was an amazing uh, consumer program which incorporated satire, humour and entertainment and ran for 21 years. Anyway, I'm not introducing you, Dame Esther. Um, Ian Bolcom is, so I'm not going to say any more. I'll, I'll take, take away from him what he's going to say. Ian, would you please... Uh, formally introduce Dame Esther to us today. Well, Esther, delighted to see you and you've been able to join us. Of course, the motto of the BBC is nation shall speak unto nation. Perhaps that means changing now for the Zoom, for the Zoom era. But delight, I know, I've just been listening to you on Radio 2, so I know... I think he's gone. Ian's, he gone? Ian's gone. Well, he's just listening to me having um, a bit of a Barney with Roz Altman. That was quite exciting. <laughs> I think we've lost Ian Day Master, so if you wouldn't mind just uh, kicking off and if he's got anything else to say, he can say it at the end. Fine, yes. Well, um, it's been quite a, um, an eventful Monday because the Daily Mail decided to run a piece by me um, opposite a piece by Bell Mooney, both of us taking opposite views. And that's exactly what was happening to me when I was talking on Jeremy Vine's show on Radio 2. Only this time it was Ros Altman against me. And the whole um, issue is whether it's discriminatory of the government and their medical advisors to say that little old ladies like me, age 79, 
should be longer in lockdown than people half my age. Now, I take the view that the virus is discriminating um, and that actually we fare far worse, we oldies, for reasons that I don't understand, I'm not sure that anyone understands, than the young do. So my view is that actually staying at home for another three months is not going to kill us and the virus might. And that is not to underestimate the impact of loneliness and isolation because uh, we set up, we launched nationally the Silverline Helpline back on November the 25th, 2013, in order to reach out to older people who are not having a conversation, not having any contact with other people. And we knew that it would have a terrible impact on their mental health, their physical health, their emotional health. And that is indeed what we've found. Since then, we've taken nearly 3 million calls. We have 17 or 1800 trained volunteers who befriend older people who aren't talking to anyone else by uh, ringing them on those dear old landlines, many of whom are attached with a wire to the wall in the way young people cannot understand and just sharing memories, sharing experiences, sometimes sharing deep feelings that they aren't able to talk to their close family and their friends about. And um, the two words we hear most on our helpline are what I call the B words. That is busy, the world is so busy or has been, until the pandemic stopped us. We were whirling around. Um, the older people who ring the helpline say their sons are very busy, their daughters are very busy, their neighbors are very busy, people who work in shops are very busy. Everybody's so busy. And the other B word is a burden. So they don't want to burden them by talking about their feelings of loneliness, of isolation, the fact that they need company and some of our callers literally have nobody to talk to apart from our helpline for days on end, weeks on end, months on end. Indeed, I was talking to a friend of mine I've never met whose name is Margaret, who lives um, in Scotland. And she was quite ruefully amused that the world has finally caught up with her. And now other people understand what she goes through all her life which is to have no contact with anyone outside her home. Um, I have often asked Margaret how she survives and she says she lives in the past, that she lives on her memories. And I think that is disgusting because I think older people have the right to fun and the right to have something each day to look forward to. And the fact that all she does is get up in the morning and think about life as it used to be, is I think all wrong. However, it's not true on Mondays because on Mondays from 11 to 12, she joins in a Silver Line conference call. We call them Silver Circles and they support each other. And sometimes they share music. They've got a singer among them. And she told me that last week he was singing, We'll Meet Again. And I think that should be the theme of our pandemic, we will, as the, as the Queen said, and as Dame Vera Lynn says, we will meet again. And this is a temporary blip. Um, but I do think it, it might be a time when the rest of the world can think for a moment about the most isolated and vulnerable older people for whom this is their way of life. So just to tell you a little bit about the setup of the Silver Line, what happened to me was um, in uh, 2011, I moved out of my family home, which was quite big because I had quite a big family. I had a husband, I had three children, etc. And suddenly I shrank down to me and my children moved out to homes of their own. And alas, my husband passed away. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm taking up far too much space. This house needs a family, not a little old lady on her own. So off I went into a two bedroom apartment where no matter how busy I was during the day, I came home 
by myself, put the key in the door. The flat was in darkness. There was no one there to have a cup of tea with, no one to talk about my day with, and I hated it. Now, I have a daughter who is quite religious. I, myself, and I, um, I'm prepared to concede that she may well be right, but at the moment I'm agnostic. So I was a little bit shocked when I realized how much I loathed being on my own in this flat. To hear myself say to her, you know, Em, I think God wants you to move in with me. And I'm very lucky she laughed. Thank heavens for a sense of humor. And then I did what I always do when I need therapy and I rang the Daily Mail. And they said, loneliness is a very good topic. Why don't you write about it? And that's what I did. In August 2011, they printed quite a big article from me explaining my feelings. And it was greeted with the most enormous response from other people who felt as I did and said it was brave of me to admit to it because there's a stigma attached to admitting that you feel lonely. Loneliness is a bit of a shame. There were a whole lot of people who said, I don't know why you're whinging Esther, you've got your health and strength, you get out and about. Suppose you were disabled like me and had to sit facing the same four walls day after day with nobody to talk to. It's solitary confinement. There were ex um, organizations like the Rotarians, like uh, the WI, like um, Independent Age and Age UK and Cameo, which stands for Come and Meet Each Other. All of whom said, well, we do try and reach out to isolated older people, but they're very difficult to find once they've hidden behind their front doors. And I do know about that syndrome because funnily enough, I have experienced it oddly that when I moved into my flat and having lost my husband and I was occasionally invited to events or parties or whatever. And I would look at my front door and think, do they really want me to come on my own? And very often I wouldn't venture out. And that front door does become a brick wall. It becomes a barrier. And I can imagine it is difficult to find people if they lost confidence. And it affects your health in other ways. You don't take exercise because it's no fun going for a walk on your own. You don't cook proper meals because why bother when it's only you eating it? It affects physical health, it affects emotional health. And uh, seeing this huge response, I wrote another piece for the Daily Mail encapsulating some of the things I was told in the letters. And um, I was invited to take the letters to a conference being organized by an organization called um, the Campaign to End Loneliness, which is a group of charities. And that's when I had my light bulb moment and I said to them, I'm getting a flashback to a moment 25 years ago when I'd been standing in front of another group of experts. Then they were experts in child protection. This time they were experts in looking after older people. Talking about a different stigma. Then it was the stigma of abuse. Now it's the stigma of loneliness. Then the answer was a helpline, childline. Could it be that the answer this time round might be a helpline? And all the experts said, yes, it could. Why don't you go away and set one up? So I spent a year fact finding, asking the advice of other organizations that were already, um, had, had reached out to older people with helplines, usually local helplines, um, learning lessons from them and then in November 25th 2013 we launched the Silver Line nationally and since then we have received nearly three million calls and we have 1700 trained volunteer befrienders who ring people on a regular weekly basis and we have silver circles and we ran out of money. The Rotarians were very kind to us, actually specially kind last Christmas when they helped us by helping to pay for hampers we send out to people who are not getting any cards or any presents and if you like that kind of thing you might consider it for next Christmas just a thought I think it's a lovely thing to do to um, it's, it's very niche 
Um, it makes a huge difference. People love these little hampers. So anyway, it's just a thought. If you don't ask, you don't get. But unfortunately, what happened to the silver line was that it, um, having been funded by the big lottery fund for five years, when we tried to replace that funding, we found out just how difficult it is to raise money for older people. Here's an interesting quiz for you. Do you think there is a charity looking after older people in the top 10 charities in Britain? Well, there isn't one. Do you think there is a charity looking after older people in the top 20 charities working in Britain? Well, there isn't one. Do you think there is a charity looking after older people in the top 30 or the top 40? Well, there isn't one. Age UK comes in at number 46. And that, I'm afraid, is a measurement of the way older people more or less fall off the national agenda. So what has happened now is the pandemic has drawn attention to the invisible, inaudible members of the population who are in care homes or who are in their own homes being looked after by carers who come and visit them and who are older people and who are particularly vulnerable, alas, to this hideous pandemic. So I could pause there for a moment because I understand that there is a technical way that some people can ask me questions. I'm not sure if it's going to work. Now, anybody who would like to ask a question to Esther, can you please put your hand up? Nahid, Nahid, will you unmute yourself, please, and ask your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Esther, for what you've done and what you're doing. Uh, it's just... I know somebody who lives on her own with her husband who had um, stroke 10 years and she's 86 looking after husband of 90, 90 and he, uh, they have, uh, I mean, sometimes I call her, she hasn't been speaking because she just look after her husband, people like her as well. And also, could I ask you, uh, the percentage of the calls you had from older people since coronavirus? must be really high. As a Rotarian, uh, we would love to help uh, Silver Line and we would like to do the hamper or whatever you said. Uh, after this coronavirus, hopefully gone soon, uh, would you, could I invite you to my Rotary Club as well? Where is your Rotary Club? Harrow. Harrow. Oh, I, can, I can make it to Harrow. If I'm allowed out in my car, I would with great pleasure I would drive to Harrow. Well, you know, what you've just described um, is the situation of many of our Silver Line callers. I ought to say that it's, of course, free to the callers, it's confidential, and it's open 24-7. Yeah. And uh, I've got a friend I've never met who's written me um, several letters. She's not on the internet, and I ring her on a regular basis. She's about the same age as your friend and her husband had dementia and she cared for him for six years and uh, he died in September and during all the time that uh, she was ringing the silver line and he was alive you know she she once said to me it's a very quiet house because her husband had dementia and depression and never spoke to her and he had to go into a nursing home. She said at one stage, it was a matter of luck which one of us would fall over in the shower first because she was trying to wash him, shower him, dress him, feed him and so on. But she has agoraphobia. And so she literally cannot get out of the house now. And all she has is the conference call that she does on Mondays with the Silver Line and the phone calls that I make to her. She's a lovely woman. So it is extremely sad that there are people who have lively minds, very intelligent, very caring, but through life circumstance are entirely on their own. I often think loneliness is caused by loss, you know? It can be loss of a partner, loss of a job, loss of a driving license, loss of sight or hearing or mobility. There are so many different losses that take the underpinning, the structure of our life suddenly we lose it 
and there we are on our own, not quite knowing who we are. I had a letter from someone called Ellen who said that she'd lost her husband five years before from cancer and her son from cancer. She has a daughter who visits her twice a week, but the rest of the time she's entirely on her own. And she said to me, I am an optimist by nature and often I have to be as I face another pointless day when I'm a waste of space. And she totally lost the feeling of identity and confidence and all the things that make us what we are and who we are. But having said that, Naheem, that phone call that happens once a week or twice a week can make all the difference. And what I say to everyone is, if there's someone in your family or among your friends that you haven't spoken to for a little while, pick up the phone because it can make all the difference. Margaret, Margaret James Cooper. Yes, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I am extremely happy personally to know that um, the silver line uh, your organization has really, really taken up. Yes. Especially happy. Why? Because uh, 2011, when the organization sta that organization started, the Rotary in London, first of all, uh, you have given so much back, even to Rotary itself, because Rotary has helped you along the way. 2011, when you started, um, I was assistant editor to the Rotary in London magazine. And Jane Hammond was the editor. I was in charge of advertising, and we took Silver Line on. And up to when we stopped um, printing or going online about Rotary in London magazine, we stopped um, helping Silver Line. Um, that is one. As I say, thank you, and we've helped you, you've helped us. But my main question is, you did say something about uh, uh, people being busy to help as volunteers or it's a burden to help. I am more interested in the burden part of it. Is the burden uh, from the oldies uh, we are trying to help or the volunteers? Who, were, who was talking about the burden? The burden was the way the older people thought of themselves. Now, I really don't know why, because I'm sure that nobody would want them to feel this way. But, you know, I can remember a time when older people were respected, were the centre of the family, and far from being a burden, when I went to see my grandmother every weekend, it was a treat. We loved her company. She was the centre of the family. And then along came the 60s, the swinging 60s, with the youth culture and young people became the fashion instead of, you know, you, uh, the, the, the English had a, a proverb which was children should be seen and not heard. And that wasn't very good either. But with the youth culture, the unintended consequence was that older people were sort of swept out of the way. They were felt to be past their sell by date. And from then on, they began to think of themselves as a burden, as if um, wrinkles and gray hair meant that they weren't worth listening to, that they weren't important anymore. Well, I think that it's a real crying shame that any older person should think of himself or herself as a burden. And the wonderful thing about the fabulous Captain Tom, now Colonel Tom, who has raised over 33 million pounds by walking around his garden, is that he has proved, if any, anyone has ever doubted it, that older people, far from being a burden, are a treasure and they need to be treasured. That's what I think. And thank you for your help. Ian Volcom. Hello, Esther. Sorry, I'm back now. I do apologize. After all the uh, problems getting you on, I then uh, got cut off, but there we are. Uh, so I apologise for that, but uh, all I was going to say was, uh, you know, to thank you, well, to say that I just, I just listened to you on, on Radio 2, so I know that your time is very much taken up at, at the moment, and we're very grateful that you spared uh, the time for us, but also to say, not only have you uh, founded one charity, but two charities, and both Ch Childline and Silverline are probably more needed now than they have been at any other time. 
uh, particularly in this current difficulty. Absolutely true. And calls have gone up to both helplines. The silver line calls have gone up by 30% and so have child line. And so many children are living in homes where they're not safe, where there's violence, where there's abuse, where there's addiction and they get in touch with child line and all they can think of doing is running away and we have to find, try and find a way of making them safe. At a time when, speaking of older people and how precious and important their contribution to society is, we've had to lose so many of our child line volunteers because they're 70 plus and because we couldn't put them in a, um, in our call centers in a way that made them safe because quite often they're very close to each other sitting at tables listening to children so yes um i agree with you that this pandemic has put children and older people in danger absolutely thank you uh, colleen doyle please thanks clive hi esther on the call today there are 86 participants including yourself that is 86 people who could become your buddies in this program what is the process for us 86 to actually be the callers who become the buddies for those people and secondly how close is Silverline working with age uk and their buddy program so there's not duplication thank you um yes well um civil line is part of age uk now it's one of their subsidiary charities and I know their befriending service call in time, which is excellent. And their information and advice line, which is excellent. What we do is because um, we have our own helpline, which is open 24 seven, which theirs isn't, it's basically and fundamentally a friendship line. We do offer information and advice. We do try and solve problems. But the vast majority of our callers are talking about loneliness. And we have um, a website for the Silver Line. And if you go onto the website, um, you will see how to volunteer. Now, you will understand that we've got very small staff and it's under quite a lot of stress at the moment because everybody has now to work from home and they've had to learn to use new technology. And, you know, there are quite a lot of challenges. But if you go onto the website and mention that you're Rotarians and that you would like to volunteer and help in some way, um, I hope that you will be answered. You'll have to bear with us a bit, but I hope you will be answered and I hope we'll be able to recruit 86 Rotarians. That would be terrific. Thank you. Duchess William Silonga. I can yes, hear you. Please, please. A pleasant afternoon, um, Esther. Thank you so much for sharing your story and the great work that you've been doing with Silverline. Um, I'm a member of a, ch of a charity that supports the elderly called Penu. Um, I've just been um, recruited to be on their board of trustees. But what we've been doing is we provide um, music therapy um, in um, some of the uh, uh, care homes. Um, we've started in, it, Penu started in 2016 with a small group of volunteers. Um, out in Red Ridge and in the Newbury area. And now we've just moved into Camden and um, uh, out in the in Southwest. But um, now that we have COVID-19 taking place, um, we haven't been able to go into the care homes and provide that sort of um, uh, music therapy service and some of the craft stuff that we've been doing with the elderly. But what we have been doing is providing um, food packs uh, a lot of um, our donors have been donating um, non-perishable items and some uh, cleaning and other things because the majority of them cannot go out. So we've been going around, we've, we've changed from music therapy and other activities to um, going and distributing uh, food items and other necessities. So my question to you is um, with Silver line. I know it's a. I think it's um just a like a telephone buddy or or whatever. Is there any scope to introduce maybe some sort of activities? Because there are volunteers in different groups who would be more than happy to provide music therapies. We have professional musicians who actually we sponsor to go into the various um, care homes 
to provide music therapy because it's really helpful. It helps them um, to remember and, and get up and be active as well. May I give you my email address? And yeah. if you could drop me that idea, I'll discuss it with our CEO because it's a lovely idea. Music makes so much difference to people when they're feeling lonely and depressed. It can really lift their mood. So yeah, I think that's a really lovely welcome. idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Very elegant and distinguished lady is looking at me with some disapproval. She's got white hair and glasses and a really, really beautiful chandelier. That's, That's me. No, That's no, 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 no disapproval at all. Just very John. thoughtful. <laughs> I'm not at all. No. Oh, I think the work that you John do is, abs David. is absolutely magnificent. Oh, you but are. What, what I wonder, I wanted to tell you, tell everybody about um, how my family have been making use of this lockdown time, particularly my grandchildren. And uh, they have been pumping me and my husband as well for uh, stories about our history before they were born. And you'd be surprised what memories come out, things I'd long forgotten about. They, they're so interested in everything. And I think that that would be a nice thing if um, uh, other people want to talk to their, their grandchildren about their family uh, history, because it doesn't really, Nobody's got time for that sort of thing usually, and now nobody's doing anything. So I think they, they seem to be quite enjoying it. Hmm. Well, I'm writing a book about my memories for exactly the reason you say. I mean, I think to tell my grandchildren that when I was little, we were lucky to have one egg a week. There were no sweets. I didn't eat a banana till I was six. That there were bombs falling on that, my grandparents' house in London. All these things are, fascinate them. So I, well, they fascinate me. I wonder whether they do fascinate. I'm, now I've started to worry. Maybe I'm more interested in my own memories than they are. But um, I, th I think, it, I've got a friend, if I may plug a friend of mine, a friend of mine has invented something called Autodot Biography, which is, a-U-T-O-D-O-T-B-I-O -O -O biography, auto dot biography. And it's a computer program which enables you to write your autobiography and, and turn it into a rather beautiful book with all your photographs and birth certificates and marriage certificates and so on. So have a look at it on the, on the um, internet because I think now is the time, as you rightly say, when we have a bit of time on our hands, that we can write the story of our lives. And I think our children and grandchildren might well be interested. Thank you. I'm now going to uh, John Clements, then David Palmer, then Anna Iverson. So if you would like uh, John to unmute yourself. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Esther. Um, I'd like to just take you back for a moment to this question of discrimination. Now, I think that's an emotive term and probably not suitable. But let me explain. I'm 83 this month. My wife is 83. We've been married 63 years. And neither of us were fortunately uh, not identified as having background health problems that would make us um, identifiable. Now, this has had a kickback in that it's been uh, impossible to get home deliveries. That doesn't matter. We can deal with it. But what I do say is that if we go into this question of a lockdown for people over 70, I'm not prepared to accept that as a fit person. Um, and I wish to make my own choices and I wish to go back to my rotary luncheon and take the risk of traveling there. Uh, I will not spread the virus any more than anybody else. But of course, <clears throat> if in the interim I have a heart attack or something and then I'm on the heavier list, well, that's my choice to make. So I'd like to see a division there between those who are over 70 and are otherwise fit being permitted to uh, come out of lockdown the same as everybody, everybody else. Thank you. Well, what, what is fit? It's quite interesting, isn't it? Given that we've got a brand new virus, which is targeting people in a, in a really unprecedented way. I mean, why are people from the ethnic minorities more vulnerable? Why are men more vulnerable than women? And certainly, why are people of 70 plus 
the ones that are so seriously hit by this virus when they get it, that instead of it being a mild asymptomatic, like a common cold, it really hits them hard. And indeed, I have people in my family who are lucky to get out alive. Indeed, our prime minister, who is renowned not only for fathering heaven knows how many children, and I'm not sure he knows, but excuse me, that was probably defamatory, but also um, cycled to work every day and was renowned for being fit, suddenly he's near death. So if they do, they've done it on statistics only. They've just looked at the numbers and said, the ones who are dying are 70 plus in the greatest numbers, not all of them, but it does seem to be. And therefore, if we care about our 70 pluses, Maybe we should be asking them to take even more care of themselves because we want them to live as long as possible. Now, I'm sorry that you've been deprived of your Rotarian lunch, but I have a feeling that none of us will be going to smart lunches for a little while because I think socially distancing Rotarians from each other is going to sort of destroy the point. People have said to me they should allow us to play golf because we play golf at a great distance from anybody else. So we're not harming ourselves at all. And that discriminates against older people because it's mainly older people that enjoy golf. So I think there are a lot of questions the government have got to answer, but until they do, and until the scientists understand just why this vile virus is so much more serious as you get older, I think I'm gonna look after myself a bit. Anna Iverson, please. And then Eve Conway. Hi, uh, Anna Iverson here. I actually didn't have any questions this time. I uh, found the talk fascinating and thank you very much. I don't know how I was lodged, but I'm very appreciative of the talk. Okay, <laughs> thank, thanks, Anna. Uh, Eve Conway, please. Hi there, everybody. And, and thank you very much, Esther, for a brilliant talk to us today. Really amazing. Um, two quick questions, really. Um, we've seen uh, the government uh, volunteer appeal, if you like, with uh, three quarters of a million volunteers or people volunteering to volunteer, many of them to call lonely, isolated people. And we're hearing that many of those people are just not being asked to do anything at all. So they're very frustrated. So one thing is, could there be a way that those people who aren't being asked to volunteer, that want to volunteer, could come along and help with Silverline and also Childline. I mean, Childline may be a bit more complicated. And also, you mentioned that for five years you had big lottery funding. So how are you managing the funding now? Um, and I know Rotary has been very instrumental in helping <coughs> in the past and will be in the future and the present. And, and actually, I'll ask three questions <laughs> just to be, be willing to hear. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about the situation with our elder people, older people now, and the fact that, you know, that there's the what's happened in the nursing homes, et cetera, et cetera, could be an indication of how maybe not politically correct the government felt about older people and whether it was worth actually um, looking at saving them. Um, so do you think there will be any improvement uh, coming out of this pandemic with the way we treat um, our elder older, more vulnerable people? Okay, well, taking those three excellent questions, the first one, you know, there is a real problem when any organization is inundated with Office for Help. I remember when we launched Childline, we had so many Office of Help and we had a tiny team and we just couldn't process it. And the problem we have now in the silver line and child line is obviously when people offer help, they've got to be checked out. You've got to get references. You've got to make sure that they haven't got convictions, etc. And it takes time and it takes a lot of admin. So until somebody, Bill Gates or somebody, invents an algorithm, which means that you can instantly check out volunteers, I'm afraid quite a lot of lovely people don't get their offers of help accepted, except locally. And my recommendation is always that if you can contact your local parish council, your local county council, whatever, and say, look, I'm available uh, and I can drive a car. Do you want me to go shopping? Do you want me to deliver stuff? What would you like me to do? 
the smaller the unit that you're approaching, the more likely it is that they will have the resources to use your very high number of help. When it comes to funding, um, it's a real problem because, um, as I say, trying to find the funds for any charity working with older people is really difficult. Older donkeys, fine. Waifs and strays, dogs, cats, um, <laughs> fine. People. So mainly we get our funds from organizations like Rotarians, um, uh, foundations, grant giving foundations, uh, people who, um, corporates who uh, work with older people, and much, much less from the public because um, whereas when Childline was launched, the public sent, did send us lots of money because they do care, thank God, about children. When it came to older people, we didn't get the same response at all. And are we going to change for the better as a result of the pandemic? I hope we do. I think the problem with care homes is quite complicated because the care homes, you don't go into a care home unless you're pretty fragile. And it may be for all sorts of different reasons, physical, mental. And a lot of them are privately run. Um, they, they aren't in a one big structure like the NHS. So I think it always was going to be complicated. But I'm really glad that people at long last have noticed. Of course, with the Silver Line, we work with people, most of whom are in their own homes and are cared for in their own homes, depend on care. And they are also forgotten and invisible. So I'm hoping that we will pay attention much more closely than we have in the past to the older people in our community who are such an important resource. Yeah. Can I just, I got to, I see David Palmer came back. David, did you have a question? Okay. Um, Esther, um, when first you started the uh, programme for Silverline back in the, uh, 2012, 2030s. I had a job in Rotary where I was able to visit um, every club in the district and, and other organisations and I uh, was able to cooperate with you and uh, 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 put the whole uh, opportunity to people to volunteer for Silverline and that was taken up with, in some numbers and uh, that's, that's gone forward. What I've done in the last couple of um, uh, weeks really is I've put together my own little mini silver line program a bit cheekily using the name but uh, uh, all I've done is to make a list of people it could be anybody friends relatives and just make a phone call and it's been absolutely spectacularly pleasant a little phone call I thought that might take five minutes runs into half an hour absolutely lovely cousins friends old business people, Rotarians, people who have really welcomed just to have a phone call. And I'm getting the phones back. So I think that your suggestion that we should actually make a point of speaking um, to um, people who may be lonely or may just uh, be fed up with being isolated uh, is a good one. And I can tell you that it, it's, it's going down very well. Would you mind- Thank you. Dropping, would you mind dropping me an email? Mm -hmm. I'll be pleased to, yeah. It's such a brilliant idea. If you could give me a little bit of detail, the kind of people that you've put on your list, I think that's fantastic. Because I really do think the telephone is such, um, such an emotional way of touching people, of reaching out to people, because you, you tell so much from someone's voice, don't you? You tell their mood, you can make them laugh. It's, it's, it's really, it makes a huge difference. So drop me an email and I will pass on your idea. Thank you. Uh, Tony Finkel, uh, you had a question. Thank you. I just wanted to say, Dame Esther, that it was really great to hear you saying, um, you know, your view on um, the 70s and vulnerable people at home, because there seems to be this outcry again by the media, um, trying to say that everybody who's been asked to shield stay at home is like we want to get out etc 
Um, and I think like they misread the mood of different things about unlocking. I think they've mi misread the mood about that. I know we've had uh, a member of London Club saying how he'd like to be out at the club and uh, playing, uh, meeting his friends, etc. We're all entitled to our own views. But as a younger person who's uh, vulnerable and been told to shield, I actually appreciate it and think, you know, I'd rather be here to see my family and my grandchildren than actually go out, meet my friends for coffee and end up catching something that could kill me. So I just wanted to thank you for, as usual, extremely sensible um, words. My husband's a silver lining. Oh, and my husband <laughs> wanted to say he's a silver lining. <laughs> well, I think it's very kind of you because um, I, I have been beaten around the head quite a lot by people who, th who think I'm discriminating against. And really what I'm trying to do is to say we need to continue to protect our old people. They are immensely valuable and we don't want to put them at risk. Thank you. Can we now move on to Varsi? Varsi, you have a question. Thank you very much, Esther. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. You touched on so many different subjects. Uh, my question is, um, the volunteers um, who go around um, distributing food to vulnerable and old pe older people, I mean, how do they pick them? I mean, is that a list? I'm asking you this question because um, I received several packages of food. And um, I actually, I was very thankful that they brought it, but I didn't need it because fortunately, um, I had help from my son, actually from abroad, who um, was able to order some food for me via Amazon or via Waitress. Because I, I was sick, I, I'm a coronavirus survivor. <laughs> And I was really, very really depressed. And I mean, I didn't show it to people. Everybody said I looked good and this and that, but I was uh, upset and lonely and felt depressed. But my question is again, um, how do they choose? Because for example, I told this guy to take, um, you know, the food away about three times because I had food in the house, but I didn't need it. And I told him, please give it to people who, um, you know, to who actually need it, uh, you know, are not able to um, go out shopping because they're giving it to the wrong people. That's what I meant. How, how, do, how do they, is that a list of some sort with their age or with their vulnerability or? GPs. GPs. I think the list comes from GPs and it's GPs who need to check it out. So if you have a GP, I think you need to tell them that grateful as you are, you don't need it. Okay. Uh, Tim, it's uh, now five to two. Uh, perhaps it's time, I think we've got to call it a day on the questions. Uh, what about a vote of thanks? Who's doing that today? First of all, from me, uh, Dame Master, thank you very much indeed. Um, I believe you have a significant, you've told us you're 79. I think your birthday is next month. It all is. What I can say is 80 is now the new 40. I agree. Absolutely amazing for someone who is virtually 80. Absolutely extraordinary. Anyway, I'm not doing the vote of thanks. I have asked past president Neville Shulman to do the vote of thanks today. Neville, are you there? Hi, hi yes. Can, can you hear me, Esther? Neville, why aren't you up a mountain? Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would be up a mountain if you'd come with me. That would be great. You know, I, I could do with, with you next to me. Your, your cheerfulness, your, your, your vivacity would carry me up to the summit with, with no problem. So that uh, it's, it's my great pleasure, obviously, to see you always and to, and to listen to your words of wisdom and obviously to, to give the vote of thanks on behalf of the Votary Club of London. I mean, it's uh, been a magnificent um, uh, um, pouring out of words of wisdom and thought and, and care and, and beauty so that um, you're a lady with with so much beauty in your soul that it pours out to all so that I think we're, we're all enthralled by, by listening with, with you. And as you, you and I go back a long way, so I'm very privileged to, to have you as my friend and to know that we've shared many occasions, but I'm a, a big follower of yours. And uh, a silver, silver Line is such a special, unique organization.
but it's reaching out in so many ways and it's got you're talking about plants so it's got like branches that, that, that go out in, in every single direction so that it's something very very exciting to to be author of and um i was wondering i i, I was trying to ask the sort of question i don't know i can put it into my book but, uh, because uh, you have and because I'm also involved with, with young children in different ways, so is there some way of, of, of children from schools be, being um, aligned to older people so that they should be part of the, the school routine, part of the curriculum to have youngsters from schools working with, with older people? And as you say, children love their, their grandparents very, very much. That's a great link that missed out by the, the immediate uh, so it would be great if, if uh, kids, grandkids, particularly, obviously, were able to make the, these silver lines, these attachments to, to the older people and to, um, in, in a way, you know, create some, some, some vivacity, some joy, which, which carries, carries through. But uh, that's maybe for a, an, another occasion. So that uh, all I wanted really to say to you now is uh, that... Uh, um, you know, it, it may be in, in the biblical sense, really, uh, that may days be long because you, know, you give out so much to everyone. So I think that really you actually belong, don't you, to, to us in so many different ways. And uh, it's been a great joy. And so I would ask all, all the Rotarians that are present, if they possibly can unmute themselves at, at this moment to to clap you in the way that we clap every every Thursday the NHS so you're very much on top with all the beautiful people of the NHS and thank you so much again all our love to you. I'm sure we will be giving you a certificate won't we um will be president it's funny, Esther, that uh, Neville should mention the certificate because, in fact, I have a certificate here for you, which I will email to you. And I know this is you've spoken to us on a number of occasions, and I'm sure you have our certificates hanging up on a wall somewhere. And there is an additional one for for you from today. I'm also delighted today to present you with a check from the Rotary Club of London for two thousand five hundred pounds. Uh, which is from our um, lockdown appeal. So that will be on the way to you, Esther. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your generosity and stay safe, everyone. Thank you very Thank much, you. Esther. Fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, um, we've had talks now on the medical aspects of COVID-19. We've had two talks on the human aspects. We've had a talk about depression. Uh, and now about silver line and loneliness. Next week, we have somebody who is actually applied to join our club. Uh, his name is Klisman Marathi, um, and he's going to be talking about the economic impact of COVID-19. So we'll be looking at yet another aspect of what's going on at the moment. Please, please, please remember the lockdown appeal. If you haven't contributed or you want to contribute more, uh, please do send the money in. And I'm now going to ask you one final time to raise your glasses, your mugs, your fictional mugs if necessary, whatever, and remain seated and we will have a drink. If we could unmute, please, Clive, everybody. Let's unmute everybody. Okay, the final toast. All presents unmuted. Rotary and peace, the world over. Rotary and peace, the world over. Yeah, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.